Deleuze and Guattari repeatedly stress the importance of what they call becoming imperceptible, but the idea remains poorly understood. When this phrase gets tossed around today, especially on the internet, it's often to glorify a kind of obscurity. Deleuze and Guattari are used to justify a certain kind of hiding, I would call it. Consider, for instance, the number of anonymous Twitter accounts out there emitting what look like Deleuzean takes with a kind of esoteric style, weird usernames, usually illegible digital avatars of some kind. I take no issue with such stylistic preferences. I'm not getting down on these people. It's interesting culture. Um, and there are often good reasons for this stylistic tendency. But they usually don't follow from a deluso guattarian politics of imperceptibility. In fact, as I will explain moving forward, Deleuze and Guattari are clear that a characteristic of becoming imperceptible, insofar as they understand that idea, is having no need for masks and having nothing to hide. That's really part of the point. This is only one example of how the notion of becoming imperceptible is widely misunderstood. More importantly, though, I should begin with why becoming imperceptible, this strange concept, why it's, it's such an important and attractive idea in the first place. Not for Deleuze and Guattari, or even for their audience necessarily, but for even normal people. You or anyone out there reading my book or listening to my ideas on these videos. Even including readers who don't even know they have any reason to be interested in such a strange, obscure idea out of, you know, continental political theory. Or possibly people who even have a deep skepticism or contempt towards French post-structuralism. I actually really do think there is a, a, a important lesson of why general interest in this crucial idea in the Deleuze and Guattari works. The way I see it, and I must admit, I am going to now introduce some idiosyncratic elements to this, just the way that I see it personally. Other scholars of Deleuze may or may not agree, although I'm going to try to make a good case for what I'm presenting here. For Deleuze and Guattari, becoming imperceptible names kind of the peak experience of an agent in the process of liberation. I think that it is the essentially the pinnacle stage of escape or releasement, we might say, to borrow a phrase from Heidegger. Um, escapement or releasement from everything that seems so good at dominating and confusing and capturing our potential energy and capacities, essentially. These forces of domination are called by many names in the deluso guattarian register. They call it the molar, they call it rigid segments, the strata, etc., among other strange and somewhat interchangeable terms. One of the reasons why the models of Deleuze and Guattari are so difficult to understand, one of the reasons why their writing seems so cryptic to so many people, is that they're really trying to pinpoint the operation of these forces at a very fine resolution, but in a also the most general and abstract terms that they can find. So they're trying to develop a language that is kind of outside any particular discipline to capture a lot of the conditional variances without necessarily getting lost in the weeds, uh, trying to remain maximally applicable to diverse situations. The cost, of course, is that it's an infamous cornucopia of unwieldy terms. So for shorthand, I prefer to call these various mechanisms of domination as a set, the institutions just because that's a normal word, which everyone understands. And I think it essentially captures the point. Everywhere we look today, we see perverse institutions, often ancient institutions in path dependent zombie modes. These institutions are often characterized by certain obvious and extreme deceptions, typically internal and external. They often malfunction regularly in surprisingly predictable ways, in ways that seem easily solvable and yet structurally are prohibited by the very functioning of the institutions at some higher level. This is kind of a common experience or perception of many, you know, normal mid-level bureaucrats working for corporations or various nonprofit organizations. Schools, criminal justice systems, pathological families, corporations, universities, media, you name it. All of these institutions are essentially molar aggregates that require our participation and they capture our all of our possibilities in ways that appear increasingly insane and undesirable to increasing numbers of people. If, however, for you know extremely different reasons, or rather reasons stated in extremely different language, languages, admittedly. 
For instance, a leftist may say that the primary institutional culprits are labor markets or quote unquote institutionalized racism and so on. Whereas conservatives, if you ask them, they'll be most likely to point to the university or labor unions, etc. Um, one of the reasons for the bizarre vocabulary of Deleuze and Guattari is, I believe, they're trying to sidestep these ideologically conditional forking paths, not in some wish to be bipartisan or centrist, but simply because these are institutionally captured pathways, that so many of the normal ways of thinking and speaking are institutionally captured pathways, which foreclose access to the very problem, the deeper underlying problem we really want to understand and solve. So at stake here, in all of this talk of ideas such as, quote unquote, becoming imperceptible, at stake is figuring out how to live under the weight of increasingly complex institutions that are, they seem to be increasingly good at reproducing themselves. To understand them, not just philosophically, but empirically also, in order that we may outsmart them and maneuver with increasingly greater freedom. I think that something like this is what I mean anyway when I use the term liberation. In my own view, the scientifically valid identification of the mechanisms of liberation and their diffusion throughout a culture is all I've ever meant by revolutionary politics. I think that's all revolutionary politics could ever mean. And while Deleuze and Guattari are somewhat coy about their ultimate stances on what a successful revolutionary politics would look like, I remain convinced that their theoretical project is essentially to map and model the mechanisms of what I call liberation. Now, in any event, no matter what register one might prefer today, almost everybody is interested in some kind of escape, exit, or liberation from some kind of opaque institutional pathology today, even if they get described in very different languages and different subsections of society. So that's kind of the larger gloss here on why I think a lot of people should be interested in this and what's really at stake. So according to Deleuze and Guattari, becoming imperceptible is the crucial final stage of any genuine escape path. Not final in the sense that everything is completed once and for all, because I don't think that ever happens, I don't think they think that ever happens, but final in the sense that it's the zenith of a very particular repeatable mechanism, what they call the quote-unquote line of flight, the famous line of flight concept in their work. If they are correct, then everybody should be interested in what it means to become imperceptible. Indeed, if you wish to live at all today, rather than merely survive, I think that increasingly you have to learn how to become imperceptible. So I think we would do well to get this right. In the next video in this series, I will explain the problem with being perceptible. This so far has just kind of been some background and preliminary considerations. After that, I'll move on to explaining how becoming imperceptible works and what exactly it looks like today.